you strike me as a, you're a, a sort of completist yeah. in, in <laughs> your interest in different things, right? Yeah. So this isn't the only uh, artist that you've sort of taken this tack with. Yeah, obsessive would be the... <laughs> <laughs> well. That's the polite thing. Um, yeah. Nice shirt. I got my mud crutch on. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I was listening to... I listened to the book when you sent me the link. I spent about... Mm-hmm three, four weeks, I think, just listening to different chapters and thought, yes, really enjoyed it. It was great. But then I thought, you know, I'm going to, there was something sort of picking away at the back of my brain. And I thought it's almost, and I kind of finally figured out, this is like an album. It's not, mm-hmm. you know, the, the chapters stand alone and you can sort of listen to each chapter individually as, as, as mm-hmm. a vignette, as a, as a part but But actually sitting down and listening to it all the way through, which I did last night, I just sat down and put it on and listened to all things like, okay, now that means more now. It comes together. It's like, it's like your wildflowers. Like there's all these, it's got the same tone, it's got the same sort of, it's the same voice and it's the same, you know, sort of spirit to it. Mm-hmm. And there's, there's hits in it, you know, you've got your hits in there, but <laughs> the, the currents running through, I think, really only reveal themselves. So they did to me when I sort of sat down and spent four and a bit hours with it. So, Wow. I, I'm i really, I'm really grateful for your listening and for that kind of attention. You're the dream, dream reader. <laughs> listener of this work and um yeah I'm really excited to for it to be compared to an album because the form trying to figure out the form of a project like this is um what are the analogs that I are the what do I have to compare it to is you know other sonic work so albums um but that's a great compliment Thank so let's you. jump let's jump into that a little bit then because we'll, we'll bounce around I sent you like a, a synopsis but I always I always do this I throw that out the window yeah. when, when something interesting happens but so of the first thing I kind of would say is that your recollections of, you know, key moments in your life are very clear and very well drawn in the book. So how did you, did you have to go back and do a lot of fact checking, a lot of research? Did you keep diaries or did you start, are you just one of those people who has a very sharp, vivid memory? I am blessed and cursed with a very sharp memory. Um, at least according to me, right? Memory. <laughs> I, I yeah. have maybe just a really strong belief in my, in the factuality of my vivid memory. Um, but yeah, writing memoir, I had to rely on first my own memory. I've also uh, been a lifelong note taker, writer, journaler. So I do have a lot of written documentation from different points in my life, not only of events, but you know, the emotional environment and, you know, I could refer back to things like that. And I also tried to do some fact checking, right. With the things that I could fact check that were sort of outside of myself, but also with certain loved ones checking in. Um, But I was lucky that the loved ones that are appear in the story, um, have been very supportive and very respectful of the idea that this is um, my lens through which to to tell my experience and yeah. and trust or they're trusting of me um, that I'm going to write from a place of care, even when I'm writing about really complex things that we've all been through. And so was that sort of, must have been a little bit difficult going back through some of those journals and or re- rethinking about some of those things, like your dad passing away, obviously, which is the major theme of the book. So when you sort of go back and look at all that content that you have, how do you then sort of chisel down, well, this is how I want to structure this? Like, what was that process like? Okay, um, so that's, <laughs> yeah, so the book focuses broadly on my relationship with my dad, who was a record store manager when I was a kid and who was sort of my entree into um, into being a music obsessive and to a knowledge and history of music that was beyond my generation or beyond my yeah. awareness as a young person. And he was an alcoholic and an addict and he died um, on the day before my 17th birthday. And so this was a major, um, a major turning point and, and crucible through which the rest of my life has passed and been forged. And so 
in trying to write about something as large as this sort of primary loss of a parent um, and and how you um, how you go on without them, how you carry them with you, how that shapes other loves and losses in your life. Um, that was always, it was just sort of amorphous. It was just something, just a fact of my life that I lived yeah. with and, and walk around with and, um, and share with others, but it didn't have the form of a story. Um, until much, much later, I thought about how, what kind of container I might be able to explore these themes within and happened upon a period of my life in my early 20s when I moved to the small Indiana college town where my parents started their lives together in the 1970s, which is largely unchanged since that time period um, yeah. and sort of laid down my present and future life over their past that I didn't have full access to. Um, and so that's sort of that time period and that sort of second coming of age through grief and my time working as a radio DJ there that formed the container through which I could explore um, these themes of grief and addiction and love and memory and the ways that we repeat these primary losses that we experience, whatever they are, in different places and different ages and different bodies until maybe sometime we uh, get the needle to jump to a new groove in the record. Wow. That's, <laughs> I would say to my listeners quickly, just um, if you haven't listened to the book yet, please do. Um, that kind of lyricism, it permeates the entire thing, which is <laughs> something that I, again, it's that analogy of going back to, and again, I don't know where, how much of this was deliberate, but it does have, it's not, it's not a, a sort of an, an autobiography at all. It's not chronological. It skips around and we see sort of, we flash backwards and forwards to different parts of your life talking about the same things. Mm -hmm. But again, it has a very, very lyrical quality to it. You're not reporting, you're, it's almost like it's that introspective sort of reassessment of what you were feeling back then and thinking about it through, again, you know, you're an adult, you can think about the way you felt as a 17 year old totally differently. Yeah. So I found that I found that very, very interesting. That, and again, I, I don't know how many of those were very deliberate choices. Like the music underneath too, just gives it so much more, so much more um, like a performance element. It's all from, feels a little bit like a movie. It's almost like you could actually write that story, even if it wasn't real, if it wasn't your story, that story would still be compelling as a piece of fiction. It's just, it's, just, it's so well laid out. So that's again, amazing compliment. <laughs> that's what, <laughs> You want a compelling narrative, right? Um, yeah. I mean, I think everyone's personal stories are worthy, um, but it's often so much about finding and crafting the container to yeah. make them into a narrative that you can share, just like finding the right form for a song. Um, you're trying to, you're sort of in a song and in a, the creative space of creative nonfiction or memoir, which I was writing, um, you get to collapse time uh, into sort of the way that I at least experience time, experience my life, that my memories are happening simultaneously with whatever I'm eating for breakfast this, yeah. today and whatever I'm anticipating happening tomorrow or five years from now, all of these things are contained in the same moment. And I was hoping to sort of inhabit that kind of space because I also find that that's how we experience how grief like often manifests for us yeah. um, in different ways. So it's nice to, to feel like that was happening and those things, those elements were kind of swirling around in the narration and underscored by the music, which um, yeah. is a huge, huge gift to have this sort of original score um, under my writing. So how did that happen? Was that, because I don't know how, what was the genesis? Obviously you have the idea for the book. I'm sure you started on it before you had any publishing deal. How does the Audible thing happen? And was that part of their production value or what, how did that come about? Yeah, so I spent um, several years writing this book and imagining it as be, you know, publishing as a traditional bound text printed book yeah. that I could hand to people. Um, and then when it came time for my agent to send it to editors on submission, she included an Audible editor um, who she had worked with before on a music 
related projects. And that editor immediately heard the possibilities for merging content with form and, and using sound in a really just literal way yeah. um, that couldn't be done if it were the printed page. And I try to do my best to evoke the music and evoke, you know, Tom Petty's work through language, but language can be meager and it's nice to, it's, it was an amazing opportunity to say, well, we could actually have music and make this into a different form of storytelling. And so I was really excited by that. And then I got to enlist um, a friend of mine named Evan Stevens Hall, who's who's known for his work in the band Pine Grove, um, okay. and who's put out just a bunch of really popular and great albums um, to compose the original score. So he has said that he is also interested in his work in deconstructing American rock and and sort of classic American melodies, right? So that's okay. sort of hard forward um, pop craftsmanship. And he felt that my essays were also interested in that. And so it was a good fit. And so I recorded the narration and then sent it to him. And he composed in reaction to both my narration and having the written text. Um, so, I mean, wild. His yeah. album, Pine Grove albums are much shorter than this <laughs> sort of four and a half hour through composed uh bizarre other audio storytelling thing that we've well, created that, it, that's a totally different discipline too right like again my, my friend um randy woods who does all the uh, music for my podcast yeah he also does film scoring and tv and those kinds of things he says you do you, you've got to your brain has to change now it's first of all isn't your story so yeah. now you've got to really be attentive to what's this person actually saying and what's what's the through line what's the what's the underneath bit that you, you know those are the yeah. words what's the intent and so the caption that's really difficult but i think the Again, the, the book is so unique for that because I haven't listened to, I don't listen to a lot of Audible. I don't listen to a lot of audio books enough, but I've heard podcasts that have got music underneath, but never a book before. And it definitely just, again, it to beat it to death, but it really changes the way that you listen to it. It changes where you bring up the emotion and where you drop it back down again. It really, really accentuates that. So it was a, a just, I think it's a brilliant move and it's produced beautifully. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's the the perk of working with Audible and yeah. all of their resources. Um, but yeah, I think that Evan was really cognizant of not illustrating the music that I was talking about one-to-one, yeah. -one, but opting for more ambient and stretched out tones and um, letting, he wanted my narration and the the momentum of the language to be to serve as the percussion and to start, you know create the rhythms there and yeah. then he would sort of build around that which I thought was you know that's why I trusted him with the project because I just think he's brilliant. Well I said that written down because I'd already mentioned that the the language you use in the book is very lyrical but you've got a very good speaking voice too so that helps where we get this nice melody on top of that so let's let's jump back a little bit um, sure. and talk about growing up. Tell me about early on, what were your musical influences? What was home like with, with music? What did your, mom, did your mom and dad play? I know your dad was a record store guy, but did he actually play? Um, yeah, so I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri, and I'm an only child. I was born in 1986, and my, as I said, my dad managed a record store, which was one of a chain called Musicland, now long defunct, yeah. but... It was sort of the largest store in the region. And so he reported sales to Billboard. And so this was back when Bill, when label execs would still fly into places yeah. like South St. Louis and visit brick and mortar record stores and make sure that their artists were being prominently displayed and promoted by salespeople <laughs> and a very different ecosystem. But that resulted in um, both of my parents attending a lot of shows and backstage passes and, you know, fun stuff like that. Yeah. And they would leave me at home a lot of times, but then they would also bring me along um, as an only child and just sort of put me to sleep on a 
on a cushion or in a corner. <laughs> um, so I slept through a lot of concerts as a baby. And this was long before the sort of large baby noise canceling headphones. So it's a miracle that I can hear anything <laughs> at this point. I don't know how, uh, but no signs of tinnitus so far. Um, but yeah, they both really loved music. I think my dad was more of the lifelong music obsessive and adventurer and was always excited and looking for new and wide ranging artists and sounds. And yep. my mom, my mom was the big Bob Dylan fan, birds fan, and they both really loved Tom Petty. I don't think he was either one of their number ones, but he was always in the air. Yep. I will tell you this, they, they kept an Elvis room so an actual just room in our house that was dedicated to Elvis memorabilia, which was kind of a like weird kitschy shrine <laughs> right. that people would just give them things. And so it started out as kind of ironic and then grew into this actual devotion. Right. And so that was the sort of, there was a lot of, yeah, music, uh, baby boomer, mid-century icons of rock and roll ephemera in the house. And, um, but yeah, even after my dad stopped working for the record store, um, always bringing new music home, always playing music for me, subscribed to music magazines. So there was always Spin and Rolling Stone and yeah. things like that in the house, which I would then take and read. And uh, yeah, he was also really into hip hop. So I also, and funk, it was a huge okay. element fan and um, so that was also part of part of just what was swirling around in the house. So I was a kid who was exposed to a lot more than just the radio. Um, and so I was probably really irritating to <laughs> my peers um, because I was also probably kind of a snob and know it all about it. Yeah. Um, but I loved it. And I, I loved seeing live music and just... Um, yeah, I just shared that with my parents pretty much from the get-go. I never rejected it. Um, so eventually I, as an adolescent, I had, I got really into sort of, was the era of like third wave emo and pop punk. So I was very okay. into that. And that was sort of my independent thing going to those grimy basement shows and that culture. Um, but then I also you know, knew every Nelly lyric right. uh, on the radio. I'm from St. Louis. So, uh, and then also Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers were just always my number one. So even as I was into other scenes and the my youthful contemporaries, I repped hard uh, for Tom Petty. And I, I'm not sure why that band and and him in particular rose to the ultimate pantheon yeah. of, of my musical taste. But I mean, for all the reasons that we know of how, you know, how great yeah. he is. Um, but it was, it was really just singular. It was, it was just something I tell my friends about and knew from a young age. It's funny though, right? Because I talk, I mainly talk to people about music. That's all I ever do. Cause all my friends are musicians or musically inclined. And you can't, you know, I've got a friend who's a massive Kiss fan. He's a brilliant musician, and I just I don't, I don't like Kiss. I've tried and tried and tried, but they're just yeah. not for me. But you can't explain why you like something. There's just it's you, it's like well, it's like saying well, what describe what left is? It, well, it's it's <laughs> contextual. It, it depends. It, it's where where I am and what I'm looking at. It depends on so many variables that I can't really explain that. But do you remember? I I do remember. Well, obviously, I came to Tom Petty a lot later in life. Do you remember yeah. a point at which? that kind of penny really fully dropped where you thought, oh, wait a minute, this isn't just American Girl. It's not just running down a dream. It's not just free fun. There's a lot more beyond just these kind of, which are all phenomenal songs, but beyond the hits, when you get that dig, did you remember sort of any turning point like that? I'm trying to remember. I I write in the book an early fuzzy memory I have of my dad asking me to listen to American Girl. Yeah. And asking me to really listen to it and and how exceptional even the opening 30 seconds 
of yep. that song are and the way that it manifests anticipation and all of these different pieces that sort of arrive in the beginning. Um, and I remember him, I remember that song in particular, um, just taking hold from a really early age. Okay. Um, and I think that based on my age, I remember full moon fever really hit because it was such a big radio hit. Yeah. Um, and so it wasn't something from the seventies rock era. It was very contemporary. Yeah. It was very of, you know, 1989, 1990, it was playing from the radios at the block parties with all of our neighbors. Um, and so it was, Tom Petty felt both part of a past that I connected with my parents' origin and right. also my present as a young, as a very, very young person. And so in that way, he kind of felt monumental and spanning yeah. of all time when, you know, granted I'm four years old, but still yeah. I was aware of it and free fallen was everywhere. I won't back down was everywhere. And then the greatest hits album 93. Yeah. Um, that was always in the family car. Uh, you know, that was just constantly on rotation. I feel like we wore it out. So that with the addition of you know, just to throw away Mary Jane's last dance. Let's just stick oh. it on the greatest hits, right? Ridiculous. Crazy. Um, but also still super relevant. The music videos on MTV. It was just so, um, it was just this constant fixture in my life because then obviously yeah. Heartbreakers were on tour all the time. And if they came to St. Louis, which they always did, if they were on tour, we went. Yeah. Um, and so it was this, it was something I think Megan Fulbert said this in her episode, her interview with you. So you could set your watch by it. Right. You know, yes. you, could, you, know you count your your years and seasons by um <laughs> are the are the heartbreakers putting out an album or are they are they on tour? So um yeah, that sort of constancy, but never stale quality. Um just really, I don't know, laid yeah. a foundation in me. Yeah. So do you think, because I've, I've, I've been thinking about this quite a lot lately, that the relationship you have with, you know, if you get, when you get into an artist, the relationship that you have with their music from the point that you start listening to them forward is, it is different. It's not necessarily that you like one more than the other, but it is different because, you know, I got into Foo Fighters, I love Foo Fighters, I've seen them a bunch of times and it was Echoes, Silence, Patience and Grace was the album that I got into. So everything after that, I have a really different relationship with, you know, the color and the shape because I remember waiting for it to come out and I remember going to that tour to see that album. Mm -hmm. So with Petty, obviously you've, you're right, pretty much smack in the middle, right? You're right in the middle of his career. You've got half of it before the early yeah. stuff and then the middle period stuff and then the stuff afterwards. So how, what do you do, do you, as your relationship changed as you've got older and you've listened to the music more um, with, with that, as, as that, have you noticed that you listen to the earlier stuff differently than the latest stuff, I guess is the question. There were definitely things that it wasn't until the last, what year is it, 2022? <laughs> the last uh, 10, 10 to 11 years or so when I've been an adult, um, there were things that I missed. There were a lot of, yeah. a lot of album tracks, a lot of early the early albums, album tracks that I just didn't really know um, and never got to because I kept, we just kept playing the greatest hits album, yeah. right? Um, and so going back with intention and an adult attention has just continued to reveal to me just the astounding depth of the songwriting. And yeah. Um, that's just, I don't know. It's just, it's, it's too much. It's too many wonderful <laughs> songs. Um, so I yeah. just, yeah, I think my, my appreciation has deepened, um, as I've, I've appreciated just album. Yeah. Album depth more. Yeah. And I, like, I can always return to the hits that have been hits for my entire life. And it's one of those, again, I've talked about this before, but that he's one of those artists where, you know, he, he did have some monster hits and God only knows how they weren't number one more frequently, but 
like American Girl is just one of the best rock and roll records ever written. Yeah. But a lot of people don't listen to it. Well, you know, I, I'm not going to put it on a playlist every time because I've heard it a million times. But every time you listen to it, you're reminded that there's a reason why it's lasted. There's a reason why it's still played. And it's because it's a brilliant song. It's not, it's not cynical in being sort of, you know, brushed up for pop radio and it wasn't written with that intention, but it is perfect pop. It's got yeah. every single element and it. it's it's as lean as it needs to be. It's got all the elements you need in there, but it gets in and it gets out. And to put that tenth on album one is again, that's absolutely insane as well. But it, it's one of those few artists where the big hits are still really, really, really good songs. I think I think to me, anyways. I totally agree. And that's because they're always operating on multiple levels and emotion they're emotionally so ambivalent. Yeah, Because people hear American Girl, they hear the title, and they think they know it. They think they know what kind of portrait this is. Yeah. And it is not that at all. It's so dark. It's so ambiguous about where we are in time. Yeah. Um, it is not an ode to an object of affection. It is, it's so beyond that and so kind of bizarre lyrically that I just I, I think that's why those hits why they don't sort of have the Mona Lisa effect where people can't really hear them anymore because yeah. there is always something new to hear within it it doesn't it doesn't flatten with time there's always there's a tension always even when you think this is a simple song about not backing down yeah. there's tension within it that that makes you return to it even if you don't know why um, you're returning. And he had that sort of expert touch where he could, even when he was writing about something that was specific to him, yeah. he was smart enough to recognize, you know, if you look at some of the handwritten notes, it, there's lyrics crossed out that you can tell the sort of, well, that's, that's a little bit on the note, too much on the nose. I'll mm -hmm. broaden that out again. And that, first of all, it makes the song better just lyrically, but also then people can connect to it in different ways. And you only have to go on to any of the fan groups, the fan forums and listen to what people interpret in all these different songs. And there's a million different opinions. Yeah, you know, but because it means because if you write a song that well, I can't remember which who, who said, I think it might have been Dylan or Bono or someone said, like, once I've written the song and put it out there, it's got nothing to do with me anymore. Yeah. At that point, it's nothing to do with me. It's, and it's everything to do with you as a listener, because mm -hmm. like all art, what you take from it is that's only the only thing that's important to you. And so yeah. Tom obviously had that amazing sense of finding that exact sort of midpoint between specificity and, you know, broad appeal. Yeah. And so I teach creative writing and I'm always <laughs> harping on my students about specificity and how the more specific you are, the more universal your story actually becomes. Um, but I don't necessarily believe that to be true in song, in songwriting, yeah. in song lyrics. Like that's the primary difference between poetry and song lyrics. Lyrics need space. They need actual space. There's other things um, going on. <laughs> there's so much else going on. Yeah, right. So all of the things that, all of the, what needs to be filled in, in page poetry, you have all of these other tools um, that are evoking those emotions or those contradictions yeah. or those tensions. And, and the lyrics sometimes have to get out of the way and have to, they have to be more spare, um, which I just is such an outrageous skill that I've never possessed. So oh. well, and few, few people do. I mean, we, you know, we talk about that. I know there are, there's a million fans like us of other artists. There's people, Springsteen and Elvis and Dylan and people have written books on all those different people, but I connect with Tom Petty's music and I, just, I connect in a way that I don't really connect with anyone else's. And I grew up, I'm a huge Beatles fan. I'm a huge Queen fan and I love those, but I don't connect. And I think it is partial that I connect with his, his writing, his lyrics differently yeah. because because they're so he, he was obviously very well read that comes through in his lyrics you can tell that he you know he must obviously was a big fan of mark twain and, his, and all these people because he has those you bring and steinbeck and he because he brings all of those images in right those sort of you know you get that southern california thing that steinbeck was so brilliant at writing you know you get like three words and you've got the whole silliness valley in your brain and tom could do that as well mm -hmm. you know and again with with rebels the the way that that song sets up like i said yeah. i think that's probably the best two lines to open any Tom Petty song, maybe any song. Mm -hmm. Tony, I'm Tony, I'm too, uh, was it? Tony, don't walk out, I'm too drunk to follow. <laughs> that whole story in two lines. And then he expands on it and then kind of goes through the narrative. But 
my God, that's it, it's such a talent, right? And that's what that's what I've always connected to is that once I got into and realized and twigged, oh wait a minute, this guy's writing way more than just superficial pop songs. There's a lot here. Such yeah, incredible. and even that song, it's. I mean, he's he's really comfortable writing in character. Yeah, you know, which is huge. Um, and but there's such leaps between verses. Yeah, on that song and from the verse to the chorus, right? There's dissonance between them that yeah. makes you create new meaning, right? That is not just I'm writing in the voice of, you know, this caricature of a Southern man yeah. who's hung up on the past or something. It's more complicated than that. And yeah. that's also part of the space that he creates in these leaps and that he's not there. I mean, we should praise him for being so simple you know, for like doing simplicity so masterfully. Yeah. Um, and yet I also don't feel that a lot of these lyrics are holding the hand of the listener to get the meaning. Yeah. They're not dumbed down. They're they're yeah, like, yeah, you're gonna, you're gonna, you know, input your own meaning, you're gonna make this leap with me, you're gonna, yeah. you know, find an entry point into this. Um so I, you know, that I like too, right? We like yeah. artists who think that we can, the listeners can be partners with them. Yeah, trust us. Trust us, we'll, we'll get it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that the, that art relies on that exchange between the creator and the listener. Yeah. Right? Um, that it, it's not fulfilled before it reaches that that space between people. Yeah, that social contract needs both sides, right? It's one thing that, like I said, I'm a huge fan of Queen too, but and Roger Taylor, who I think is, you know, is one of my idols as a drummer, when he writes lyrics that are sort of fluffy and throwaway, he's brilliant at it. As soon as he tries to be <laughs> earnest, he beats you over the head with what with his message. It's like, oh my God, it's just painful. And again, <laughs> when Petty was writing, writing earnestly, he was able to sort of not do that. And I think it is that thing of, I'm going to put this out there and I'm going to trust that the people listening to it have a brain in their head and they can understand what I'm trying to put out there and they're going to put their own spin on it. But at least, you know, and again, it is that trust thing. I think that's very attractive, right? When when someone is confident enough in their own sort of voice and message, but also trusts you to do something with it. Yeah. That just really, that's very, very appealing as a listener. It really is. Gosh, I'm just thinking about the the bridge of even the losers. Which is, I mean, like you're talking about just like an image, a whole scene, a whole yeah. world within a few words is just two cars parked on the overpass, rocks hit the water like broken glass. Yeah. I should have known right then it was too good to last. <laughs> like that's everything. That's everything. How'd you do that? Yeah. And he did it. I mean, that's the thing too, is you, a lot of artists get lucky or they, they hit gold like that two or three times in their catalog. Mm -hmm. Petty does it like I've found every single, almost every single song's got one line in it and every album's got one lyric in it that's just that level of sort of, holy crap, that's brilliant, absolutely brilliant. I mean, the whole of um, Have, uh, Have Love Will Travel or the whole of Room at the Top or, the, you know, the, all, there's so many songs that it's like, who who continually comes in with these these lyrics? Like, can you imagine being Ben Montench and Mike Campbell going, oh, he's done it again, <laughs> he's got another one. You know, so. <laughs> no, they're probably over it. They're like, ah. Uh... Maybe, yeah. <laughs> Bit maudlin. Um, I'm so <laughs> glad to hear you. I feel like no one talks about Have Love Will Travel, and that's a oh. personal favorite of mine. I really, really love that song. I would play that on my radio show as often as they yeah. let me. <laughs> One, I love, what I love about that too is the the rhythm and the cadence of the the lyrics. They're not set. They change verse to verse. There's they stop at points where you're not necessarily expecting them to. And again, he was so good at that too of sort of bending his syllables around where he needed the the bounce and the ebb and flow of the the melody to go right yeah. and yeah. once you start listening it's like man this there's so much intention in everything he did and you don't realize that until you really start listening think no that's that's not accidental you've really got to be a good yeah. craftsman you've got to be a good studio worker but you've also got to just have the ear to say well how about if we do if i pronounce it this way that's going to change the way that feels in the song and you know yeah yeah what a genius so what was <laughs> what was the first show do you, do you remember then the first show that you went to the first live performance um, no, because I was probably asleep. Young. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I had a history of sort of making it through the opener, maybe. Right. Yeah. Um, but it would have been the first Heartbreaker show would have been at um Riverport Amphitheater outside okay. St. Louis. 
because that's where they um, where they performed when they came through our city. And that was so I saw the Heartbreakers perform um, more times than I know. I've lost count. Um, yeah. and it was always there, except for a couple of I saw them at Summerfest in Milwaukee and I saw them in Indianapolis once. And then I saw the um, Mud Crutch tour. Yeah. Yes, in Denver, the opening night of that tour. Yeah, I remember in, in the book you say you could see up his nose. You were so close. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was amazing because at that point I was the music editor of Westward, which is Denver's alternative weekly newspaper. And so I had a photo pass. And so I was in that, wow. that seam right below the stage. And it was, I was like, I mean, it was very surreal. Yeah. Um, at that point, I was about to turn 30. And I was so close. I was just so close. And I never thought I would be that close. Um, yeah, to I mean, Very bizarre moment um, while trying to be chill. Professional. <laughs> trying to be chill. <laughs> trying to be, yeah, don't be weird about it. Um, but yeah, I am I feel I feel lucky that I had that experience because that was the last time that I saw him perform. One thing I've never asked anyone who's seen both the Heartbreakers and Mudcrutch, mm. was there a difference in how it felt? Because it's, it's, you know, it, there's no reason to put Mudcrutch back together for Tom Petty. Like he's an arena rocker, he can sell out. You know, there's no reason to do that other than I love music. I want to play with my friends again. So I'm going to do that. So I, I imagine that it would have been looser in a sense because you're playing smaller venues with guys that aren't necessarily household names. But did yeah. that come across? Was that something, was it, did it feel more casual? Did it feel more... Yes, it was very different than a Heartbreaker show. Very yeah. different. I mean, it was the smallest venue that I had seen Petty perform in because it was a small theater right. and not a huge amphitheater or arena. Um, so that was really interesting. And it was a he really seemed to take pains to step aside and yeah. to not be the full on band leader that he is in the heartbreakers. Um, it was, it, he made more space for Mike Campbell. He made space. Um, now I'm forgetting Tom Ledden. Tom Ledden. Uh, yeah. He made space for other people that are not in the heartbreakers um, to step forward and sing lead and yeah. talk to the crowd. And that was a, it was a very different dynamic. And I don't, it honestly didn't feel totally comfortable. Right. But that's also to be expected when it was the first night of the tour and you're basically bringing out some of, some of that release was uh, Juvenilia. Yeah. You know, retreading stuff from when they were teenagers. <laughs> and, and that there's discomfort in that right like there and also a feeling of yeah this is we're not saying this is the best work that yeah. we've ever done or at least not all of us and <laughs> it's gonna be sloppy and there's gonna be half-formed ideas and um things that we got really good at later like this is but we've been preserving this in amber and for tonight we're melting it down and, and showing it to you um, so it was, it was really interesting, but it was also, you know, congenial and, and yeah. interesting. Yeah. Well, it's funny because bands don't get to do that, right? They don't get to pull the stuff before they were in this famous band and go and do it. And I remember, well, listen to the, the Fillmore release, you know, just yeah. recently listening to Benmont talking about it. And he said that that's when they did the Fillmore stuff, it was loose. And because they, they'd literally try something, they would do a cover version that they hadn't done in 20 years in soundcheck. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, let's close enough. Let's just go and do it. And they've got to roll with it and see what happens. So you yeah. imagine that, you know, going back and doing mud crush must've been, Ben Mont must've been all over that. He must've been oh, in straight away. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think, I mean, it did. I think it gave Ben Mont space yeah. too. Yeah. Um, and ju just in terms of sound, it just, it's just some of the songs that they are from that performance sound closer to sort of Ben Mont so solo. Yeah. Releases too. So it just a, yeah, just a slightly like you could, like if this was not just a different take on the Heartbreakers, it did feel like a different thing. A different band. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. So of all the shows you went to then, 
is the one that sticks out as being sort of special and not necessarily, you know, the band was at its best or the set list mm. was the best or something that happens. I know that there was um, obviously a show that you went to where something pretty cool happened with your mom. So was, was that the, would that, would that rank up there? Didn't your mom... Was that the one with, um, when with Mike the... Campbell collapsed? Well, no, with the, well, I was thinking about the proposal, wasn't that at? Oh, that a yeah. Show? I, so my, yeah, my, um, my mom was proposed to by my stepdad at Red Rocks Amphitheater. Oh, and it was the day after they saw the Heartbreakers. It was the day after, okay. Yeah, they went back and it was during the day. Um, but they had seen the Heartbreakers at Red Rocks Amphitheater. And so I did I wasn't there for it, but that was very special for them. And for him, he did it because uh he my mom got him into the heartbreakers yeah. as as we've done with many of our romantic partners and friends over the years of bringing them along with us to shows yeah. and then totally converted so i found that i found that very sweet in the book too that he came and asked your permission yeah that's an old school attitude that you yeah. don't have to do that but obviously he recognized the, the very strong relationship between you and your mom yes I wanted to make sure that you were okay with that I thought that was very very cool very classy yes yes Jim is yeah Jim is old school yeah Jim Jim really really values just really values family which sounds like a very cliche and general thing to say but it really, he took it really seriously. And so he asked my permission as her adult daughter. And yeah. he also asked my, her father, my grandfather's blessing. So cool. Yeah. So when, when did writing become like your thing? Did you know from an early age that I want to write? That's what I want to do. Yeah. I, I don't know. It was a compulsion yeah. from an early age. Um, I, I mean, maybe it comes from being an only child. Um, with a vivid imagination and having to entertain yourself, but I was always making up stories um, and also trying to process my experiences and feelings yeah. through through language and through written language. And so, um, yeah, my earliest memories are making up stories, writing newspapers, putting on plays with my cousins and neighbors and stuff like that. So always been a language person and sort okay. of directed in that way um and took it really it started in journalism um and took that really seriously in high school and in college got the opportunity to dig into creative writing and explore okay. um writing fiction short stories poetry creative nonfiction um and then when I graduated college I it was into the great recession great time to be an English <laughs> literature major graduating in 2008 and uh I was trying to I moved back home with my mom to St. Louis and got a job working at a university as an admin okay and was trying to figure out how to keep writing because I knew that that was what I wanted to do and um to write professionally to write books and when I was taken away from a really vibrant community, I had to figure out how do I, how do I keep doing this? Yeah. How do I get better at my craft when no one's asking for it? So I had to trick myself into getting someone to ask for it. And I thought, <laughs> what can I, what can I write about? Um, what can I sort of combine my interests? And um, I, I thought I've spent most of my time thinking about music <laughs> and yeah. going to live shows and thinking about popular music. And so I put together a pitch to St. Louis's alternative weekly newspaper, um, a very well-researched pitch about a band that was coming to town and doing really interesting things with um, sort of crowdfunding and social media before that was okay. our whole lives. Um, and it was rejected. My pitch was <laughs> rejected. Right. Um, but the editor, the great Annie Zaleski, who's a really wonderful music critic, um, she started giving me assignments to interview bands and review concerts. And I fell in love with the process. And yeah. so um, and I found that I this was a way that I could write on deadline with stakes, yep. relatively small. I could get paid a little bit of money to do this. And 
um, there was an audience, some audience on the other end of this that it mattered to. And I could keep getting better at my craft, at least in some ways, um, doing that. And so I was a music journalist for a couple of years and then I went to graduate school. Uh, I decided that I needed that time um, to focus on fiction writing. And so I went to a three-year MFA program in Indiana, which is the setting and time period of the book. So that's what took me to Indiana, just sort of happenstance. But when I got the offer to go there. It felt I was deciding between a couple of places and it okay. seemed like this is a really rich opportunity to go to this landscape that I've never lived in, but that is so formative to, right. to why I exist and how I exist. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so sent me to grad school and then after graduate school, I was sort of working in the music scene in that town for a little while, and then got a job as the music editor of Denver's all weekly newspaper. So okay. moved there. And um, since then, since I left that job, I've sort of bounced around freelance writing, freelance editing, um, working on this book and doing artist fellowships and residencies. Yeah. So kind of going to different places around the US that where I can afford to write and live. Um, and now I am based in Baltimore, Maryland yep. for the foreseeable future home base. And I am teaching creative writing and music criticism um, at Johns Hopkins University. And I am thinking about the next book. I always tell my, I'm a soccer coach as well. And I always tell mm-hmm. my players, take what you do seriously, never take yourself seriously. Yeah. So to loop it back to your book, was that difficult then sort of finding that line about okay, writing and, and doing critique on a band or a show or whatever it may be is one thing, but being honest with yourself is really mm-hmm. difficult. And so was was that process, did, was, did that sort of that examination of your of your feelings and, and what you went through in, in your life, did that sort of, was that uncomfortable? Did it change the way you think about certain parts of your personality was there any sort of there would be personal growth there what was that process like that's fascinating to me yeah yeah I think with writing memoir um you have to have I have to have enough space from and cut like distance right time geographic whatever um from the events and crises and full-on immersion Um, in those experiences before I can write about them, before I can see the narrative and a narrative that not only is useful for me to tell myself, but that might be meaningful to share. Okay. Um, And so, yeah, in looking, in, in writing and trying to inhabit and recreate events of my life from, um, you know, seven to 15 to yeah. 25 years ago um I have to revisit past selves um and that distance helps me to see my own actions and reactions and biases and yeah. pitfalls and vulnerabilities and um things that I can have sympathy for that I might not have had sympathy for myself (laughs) in the moment. Um, I hope that I can see it more clearly, even though time has passed, but it is difficult. And the same goes for um, the same goes for representing, you know, people in my life. Try, I try to, I'm never writing anything to settle a score because I don't, I don't think that makes a good story. I don't think that's actually interesting to anyone except me (laughs) and and maybe and the smallest parts of myself you know it's it's why and it's that's that exact thing is why most rock biogs suck for me it's because (laughs) they they are all about that and they're all sort of you know this guy said that and this guy and it's okay well what were you thinking and what i'd loved about your book is that you characterize yourself very well i mean the the people you treat the people you're, you're bringing into the story with respect you don't apologize for anything that happens or you don't sort of make excuses for it but it's clear that you sort of you thought, okay, well, who is this 
it's me, but who is this person in this story? Yeah. So again, I think that, so it almost like that, maybe the, that time and distance, like you're saying, that objectivity, maybe you couldn't have written this in Burlington, right? Maybe it would have been a little bit yeah. too too close, so. Oh, absolutely not. I couldn't figure out how to get my shoes on in Bloomington. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, because it's, it's an I. I'm writing from the first person. Yeah. I'm saying, I am doing all of these things. I am feeling all of these things, but it's a different I then the like the I who is acting, the I that is being represented is different from the I who is writing. Yeah. The story. And, is, and then different from the I who's narrating those words that have been written. Um, and so in that way, I feel close to the songwriterly I um, that is, I'm drawing from facts. I'm not changing, I'm changing yeah. some names, but I'm not changing facts or at least like my memory of how things happened um but there are many selves contained in that eye and um also room for error and hopefully room for other people yeah to also enter that space and um you know and and spend some time with a, a flawed narrator um but yeah, yeah I try to be fair I try to write from a place of of love and that goes for uh, myself as well when I think I think you've absolutely nailed it in the book. So the last part of that then to wrap up that the book is usually as a writer, once you finish the you've put the last period on the last sentence, then it goes away and then you're done with it. But of course, you then have to revisit again to narrate it. Yeah. And so obviously you did a bit of you did. How long were you a DJ? How long did you DJ for in different uh, four years? Okay, so do you enjoy the performance element then? Was that something you sort of yeah. Was that unnatural? Okay. Yeah, I really did. I'd never done, I never really done this kind of work before or this sustained work. Um, and most of my radio work, it was not pre-recorded. I mean, everything was live. It yeah. would then live on sometimes in podcast form, but it was in the moment. So it was very different to have to perform set text and to yeah. translate that into an audio performance. And I had to edit the text even as it got to the recording studio because sentences were too tricky or too yeah. you know they, they were right on the page but <laughs> they would trip you up as a listener to yeah. you know they were too convoluted I had to you know just sort of add more periods um and the right pauses and rem even time markers so yeah. reminding listeners where we are in time because you can't flip back a page easily and say wait where what's happening here I have to kind of give you little signals about um how we're moving through space yeah. so that you can just be carried along and not um yeah not have to not be totally lost so I think the scoring also helps to indicate certain things um movements between sections here I here is I'm where I'm describing you know a scene in action and here is where I'm moving more into contemplation yeah. or thinking about um what I've just experienced or discussing Tom Petty music um so and and so I had to figure out what does a story that is audio first what do those readers listeners need that is beyond just yeah. my carefully crafted sentences. And it's funny to you say that because I, I run, run up against this all the time because I write my script for my episodes. And it's like, and when I say it out loud, it's like, oh, that's really awkward. There's too many consonants <laughs> in there. Everything's jagged. Like, I'll have to change that and edit yeah. it on the fly, right? You think, oh, that doesn't work because on paper, it looks beautiful. Yeah. But when you say it, it just, it's the same with songs. Like you, you see that all the time with, I wonder why they put that lyric in there or that word when they could have used this word. But when you sing that word, it's like, oh, that doesn't work. That's why it just sibilantly, it just doesn't, doesn't fit you know yeah totally okay so let's loop this back and we're going to finish up okay. I would say that it's this has been a little bit surreal and it's been a very different interview too because I actually feel like I know quite a bit about you from listening <laughs> yeah, to the you book do. right so most yeah. guests I have to sort of dig in okay well what's the motivation what's okay well I know I you've laid everything out on a plate <laughs> very authentically um, and I would urge people, I'll, I'll let you sort of tell people where they can find the book um, if you're considering listening to this I would say definitely it's a good book to dip in and out of. You can listen to chapters as standalone sort of, you know, essays or whatever you want to sort of frame those, but definitely give it a listen through. Set aside four hours, four hours, 20, whatever the length is, because when you listen to it in one goal, 
it really changes. It really changes. Again, it's the difference between listening to, you know, Crawling Back to You and You Wreck Me and Honey Bee off Wildflowers and listening to Wildflowers. That's the difference to me. And it really hit me when I sat down and listened to the whole thing all the way through. So thank you very much. It's a fantastic book. It's an absolutely fantastic book. Beautifully written. Beautifully narrated. The music underscore is uh, score is fantastic. Adds so much to it. Um, really loved everything about it. So where can people find the book? Thank you so much, Kev. Um, yeah, maybe save it for a long road trip. Four yes. and a half hours. Um, so the book Dead Dad Club is the name of the book. Dead Dad Club on Grief and Tom Petty. And it is available as an Audible original. So it's available through the Audible audiobooks, audio content service. You can access the book, I believe, for free if you are a certain level of Audible subscriber. You can try Audible for 30 days for free, trial subscription, um, check out the book that way. But that is, it's available exclusively on Audible. And you can find me and more of my work at katiemolton.com or on um, Instagram, and less so Twitter at KJ Moulton. So perfect. And I would, I would, and I would urge people to go buy the book because, as we talked about in this episode, artists should be paid for what they do. We can get things. <laughs> Don't for worry, free. I got paid. I got paid. <laughs> I got paid. Now I just want, I just want to to share the work with others. So, but thank you, and thank awesome. you so much for having me. Thank you for this, for the Tom Petty project um and this amazing work that you're doing and you're a really excellent uh analyst of the songs the individual songs i really am getting a lot from from your listening to them me too <laughs> it is it's because again you listen under headphones and it's like wait a minute is he is that he's playing a cowbell there i'd never noticed that before there's, there's so many little things in there right that you just yeah. think that's so clever or yeah. what was i listening to I didn't realize that, you know, um, You Got Lucky was they had the sequence drums and then Stan plays over top. But when you really listen closely, oh, yeah, actually, now I can hear where they're cutting those in and out. You can you can really hear it. It's really noticeable. So, it's awesome. so much stuff. It's so rich a catalog to get through. So thank you so much for your time. I really, really enjoyed it. I was really looking forward to this one. Like I said, it's it's different. Like I spoke to John Scott. John's brilliant. And he's kind of got that origin story with Tom. And, and speaking yeah. to Paul Zolo was wonderful. And they're both lovely men. But they wrote about Tom. Yeah. where you wrote about yourself with Tom as the the anchor points to it. So that was an entirely different thing. So it's been a pleasure. And I and again, I it, it's almost that book's kind of like, it's like it's almost like a movie in some ways too, is I know that I'll go back and listen to it again because I just enjoy the the lilt and cadence of your voice. I like the language that you use and the, the lyrical nature of it and the music underneath. So it's wonderful. Repeated listening. Re, replay value. Enough, I can't thank you enough. Um, yeah, thank you so much for listening and for having me on and for your time and attention. It's um it's a huge gift. <laughs>